by the classic definition of species, if two organisms can breed and produce fertile offspring, it means that they belong to the same species. Some would argue that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are the same species, rather than separate species or even subspecies. In biology, a clade includes a common ancestor and all of its descendants, meaning it encompasses the entire evolutionary lineage stemming from that ancestor. Thus, rather than a subspecies, Neanderthals are actually a clade within the Homo sapiens lineage, which extends back to a common ancestor some 800,000 years ago. 75,000 years ago, deep within the rugged terrain of the Zagros Mountains of Western Iran, an event took place that would change the course of human history forever. Here, beneath the cold, starlit skies, Homo sapiens, newcomers to the colder climates, encountered an ancient people who had ruled the lands of Eurasia for hundreds of thousands of years, the Neanderthals. But instead of immediate conflict, something far more profound happened. Genetic exchange. Using mathematical models, some geneticists, including David Reich of Harvard University, have argued that at one point the proportion of Neanderthal DNA in humans alive today was as high as 20%, and that proportion later dwindled. That 20% figure is significant because other researchers have estimated Homo sapiens outnumbered Neanderthals 10 to 1. So perhaps the two clades interbred to such an extent that they merged together. Over time, however, modern humans lost significant amounts of Neanderthal DNA, perhaps because it carried harmful mutations. Yet at least one-fifth of the Neanderthal genome may still lurk within the modern human genome. The result was a hybrid lineage, part sapiens, part Neanderthal, a new race of humans uniquely equipped to survive the brutal Ice Age landscapes of Europe and Central Asia. These mixed offspring, the children of Zagros, inherited not only the intellectual curiosity of their sapiens ancestors, but also the strength, endurance, savage ferocity and cold-weather biological adaptations of the Neanderthals. But who were these children of Zagros? How did they thrive while pure-blooded Neanderthals gradually disappeared? How did this sapienization of the Neanderthal race occur? For centuries, Anthropologists debated whether modern humans and Neanderthals ever truly mixed, or if their encounters were purely hostile. However, the discovery of Neanderthal DNA in nearly all people today tells a different story, one of genetic exchange, survival, and perhaps necessity. The Zagros Mountains, a towering and harsh landscape stretching through modern-day Iran, Iraq, and Turkey, formed one of the first major barriers to the expansion of Homo sapiens into colder regions of Eurasia. Here the Neanderthals had already made their home, thriving in rock shelters and valleys for millennia. But when sapiens arrived, bringing with them superior weapons, complex language, and an entirely new way of thinking, the dynamic shifted. Neanderthal populations were never large, consisting of small interconnected tribes, about 20 to 30 individuals, that never exceeded 70,000 individuals during their golden age, the Eemian interglacial, which occurred around 120,000 years ago. The small population size is linked to Neanderthal's geographic isolation as a result of Ice Age climatic fluctuations in Europe. Climate and sea level changes would have favoured migrations into Eurasia. A wetter climate and lower sea levels could have enticed humans to move into the Middle East roughly 106,000 to 94,000 years ago, 89,000 to 73,000 years ago, and 59,000 to 47,000 years ago. Indeed, as Dr. David Reich has pointed out, there is no barrier between Africa and Eurasia that poses any real problem for humans to cross. Migrating within Africa, with large deserts, dense rainforests and ferocious predators, is actually more challenging than migrating out of Africa. Analysis of human genomes also appears to have revealed a weak signal of the earlier migration 100,000 years ago. However, the findings suggest that this early wave of Homo sapiens has all but vanished, so they do not significantly alter current theories about our origins. So the time frame from 89,000 to 73,000 years ago is the most likely time Neanderthals and modern humans met in the Zagros Mountains. Imagine the scene. A small band of sapiens encountering a Neanderthal clan at the mouth of Shanidar Cave. 
would there have been fear, curiosity, perhaps even an attempt at communication? Did they whisper sweet nothings beneath the leaves of an cedar tree? We can only speculate. Some scholars suspect that fierce competition between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals pushed the Neanderthals from the warmer Middle East into an ice-covered Europe. The world was almost empty, one expert on modern human origins stated. The way I personally see this, probably most people would not agree with me, the European Neanderthals had no other choice. Regarding the intermingling of Neanderthals and modern humans, he stated, I don't think it was a happy marriage. Nevertheless, other scientists imagine more peaceful encounters. I imagine that when modern humans ran into some vaguely human-like thing, they were like, this is cool, but I really don't know, especially since I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a geneticist. As reported in an article titled, Were Neanderthals More Than Cousins to Homo Sapiens? It's easy to envision the first unions between these two clades happening through both force and consent, acts of aggression and acts of companionship. The hybrid offspring born from these unions, however, would have possessed a unique advantage. Unlike their full-blood Neanderthal parents, these children inherited genetic diversity from their sapiens ancestors, making them more adaptable and fast-thinking. But unlike their fully sapiens relatives, they also carried the Neanderthal's stocky build, powerful muscles, and superior cold-weather endurance. These were the children of Zagros, the first mixed-race modern humans of Eurasia. Once established, this mixed population did not stay confined to the Zagros Mountains for long. As the climate fluctuated and the need for new hunting grounds grew, they expanded northward into the colder reaches of the Caucasus, the Altai Mountains, and the vast tundra of Siberia. But here's where the story takes an interesting twist. If the children of Zagros were merely a product of chance interbreeding, why did they thrive while full-blooded Neanderthals faded into the dust of time? One reason may have been intelligence and adaptability. The sapien's mind had already mastered the art of abstract thinking, symbolic communication, and rapid technological innovation. When combined with the brute strength of their Neanderthal mothers, the result was a new kind of human, one capable of outcompeting pure Neanderthals. In practical terms, the children of Zagros likely mastered advanced toolmaking, their sapiens' ancestry gave them superior problem-solving abilities, allowing them to refine tools beyond the traditional Neanderthal Mousterian hand axes. Sapiens are hyper-efficient and use standardized tool-making practices, while Neanderthals are more independent. This hyper-efficiency may be the primary difference between the Neanderthal mind and the modern human mind. Neanderthals were skilled ambush hunters, while sapiens favored cooperative, long-distance tracking with highly accurate long-distance weapons, including spear throwers and the bow and arrow. The hybrid children inherited both abilities and weapons, making them formidable predators. Thanks to Neanderthal DNA, the children of Zagros also had a physiological edge in icy climates. Their bodies were shorter and more compact, conserving heat efficiently. They had a tenacious, primal, unrelenting will to survive, along with a biological adaptation which helps to regulate heat and keep the body warm in frigid conditions. The children of Zagros weren't just more efficient and physically resilient, they were also more socially sophisticated. Their sapiens ancestry gave them improved communication skills, allowing them to form larger, more cooperative groups. Sapiens are hypersocial creatures, and this allows for more group bonding and stricter social control resulting in a battle-hardened mentality. One of the strangest patterns that emerges during this time is that modern humans arrive in the Arctic many thousands of years before they establish a presence in Western Europe. This suggests that our ancestors had to fight their way through most Neanderthal lands slowly, but could move more quickly when avoiding direct confrontation, using technology to exploit habitats that Neanderthals did not. Modern humans had technology, such as fur clothing, warm shelters, and fire-making technology that enabled them to live in colder regions where Neanderthals could not. They may then have expanded back into Neanderthal territory, completing a flanking maneuver around 40,000 years ago into Western Eurasia and Europe. Whatever the case, 
With these advantages, they spread across Europe and Asia, pushing deeper into the lands once dominated by full-blooded Neanderthals. Could it be that the children of Zagros were the very reason for Neanderthal and Denisovan extinction? While the children of Zagros were displacing Neanderthals in the west, they were also encountering another mysterious cousin in the east, the Denisovans. These enigmatic humans, known primarily from a handful of fossils in Siberia's Denisova cave, were a robust, mountain-adapted people, well-suited to high-altitude living. Much like their Neanderthal ancestors, the Denisovans did not vanish overnight. Instead, they merged with the incoming hybrid population, contributing crucial genetic traits, including high-altitude adaptations still found in modern Tibetans today. The result was a massive genetic fusion, a super-hybrid population that would go on to form the ancestors of many later Eurasian and indigenous American peoples. If you have European, Asian, Aboriginal, Australian or indigenous American ancestry, chances are that Neanderthal and Denisovan blood runs in your veins. This means that in some way, we are all the children of Zagros. In a world of universal similarities, ancient blood reveals another unique and curious mystery that has intrigued scientists, geneticists and historians alike. According to a new analysis of Neanderthal genomes in a study titled Blood Groups of Neanderthals and Denisova Decrypted, the ancient blood that once flowed through this long-extinct population shared more similarities with modern human blood than scientists previously thought. While it was long assumed that all Neanderthals had blood type O, the new study of previously sequenced genomes of three Neanderthal individuals reveals variations in their blood, implying that they also had blood types found in the ABO blood group system. This means that Neanderthals also had blood types A and B, in addition to blood type O, which was previously confirmed based on a single analysis. Indeed, these new analyses of Neanderthal blood group systems have helped us understand their origins, expansion, and encounters with Homo sapiens. The blood group profiles revealed an RH haplotype, a possible relic of introgression events into modern humans prior to their expansion into South Asia. The most parsimonious explanation is that the ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans already possessed the full range of the ABO system. The next surprise was that all three Neanderthals carried a rare rhesus type, which is referred to as rhesus plus incomplete. A newly discovered partial rhesus allele, reported in three Neanderthal individuals, one from the Altai Mountains, one from the Caucasus region, and one from the Balkans, was unknown in modern humans until recently, when it was discovered as a new variant. Tantalizingly, the Neanderthal from the Caucasus was a female who lived in Mesmaskaya Cave between 70,000 and 40,000 years ago. So this Neanderthal woman could be a direct Neanderthal ancestor of living humans. Therefore, this blood type is not a new variant in the historical sense, as it has been present in Neanderthals for approximately 100,000 years. This finding adds fuel to the debate over admixture events between lineages as well as the early dispersal of Homo sapiens from the Arabian Peninsula to Australia. In fact, the three Neanderthals and a few modern humans all share a nearly identical haplotype. A simple hypothesis to explain the relic of a rhesus haplotype shared by all Neanderthals in modern these individuals would be that the blood type was carried by Levantine Neanderthals and passed down to modern humans. This assumption, however, remains speculative additional analyses would be required to validate the assumption. Remarkably, this rhesus incomplete blood type is only found in a few living populations, Aboriginal Australians and Papuans, and a population of Dravidians known as the Brahuis, who live in Pakistan, and to a smaller extent in the border regions of Afghanistan and Iran. This region is not far from the Zagros Mountains, only about 1,000 kilometres. But perhaps the greatest legacy of the children of Zagros is not found in our genes, but in our very existence. Without them, the sapiens' expansion into Eurasia may have been far slower, if not impossible. Without their mixed heritage, the harshest regions of the Ice Age world may have remained unconquered by modern humans. The story of the children of Zagros is one of adaptation, survival, and biological dominance. They were not just the product of chance, but of necessity. 
an evolutionary leap that allowed modern humans to thrive in regions where pure-blooded modern humans could not. Their bloodline shaped the course of human history, laying the foundation for the diverse populations of Eurasia today. So the next time you feel the chill of winter, consider that somewhere deep in your DNA, a fragment of that ancient hybrid bloodline is still flows through time. Indeed, whether we were one species or two does not matter, because we are all one now. The children of Zagros never truly disappeared. They became us.